Judge gives custody of child to convicted pedophile. State awards joint custody of child to alleged rapist in money-making scheme. Hi, my name is Paul Gordon of iState.tv, and this is your iTalk for today. So we're talking about a man who allegedly raped a 12-year-old girl who was awarded joint custody of a child the 12-year-old girl conceived afterwards. Now, this story, well, let me start from how I stumbled upon this story. So last night, a friend of mine uh, goes by the name Agent John Smith, who also runs the Conspiracy Garden Facebook page. I highly recommend that page. I'll include a link to that in the description below. He shared a story on my personal page with a note that said, I state has to talk about this. And the headline of the story, which was from Antimedia, and I linked to the original story that I saw for this, uh, in the article that uh, will also be linked, uh, the the title read, Man Who Raped an Impregnated 12-Year-Old Now Has Joint Custody of Her Child. As you can imagine, that, that title certainly grabbed my attention, but honestly, the types of stories that I cover on iState might actually really, on the surface of it at least, might not actually include this story. At least that's what I thought. Still, I decided to put the story in the queue of possible stories I would cover the next day. So the next day, I get up in the morning doing my new sourcing, and you know I, this is already in the queue, and I'm looking at other stories. And as I went through these potential stories to cover, I'm trying to decide which stories would become the features of the categories that I cover every day. And for anyone who goes to iState.tv regularly, you know I have iTop, iTalk, iDefense, U Threat, I Build, and I Lulz. Well, as you now know, this is an iTalk, so it 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 made it to this. But at the time I didn't know that. So I came upon this story and well I decided that I was gonna go ahead and read it. As I read it, it became very clear to me that this was more than a story of the state pulling a boneheaded, potentially dangerous move. It's something that you come to expect from the state. It's not, not a surprise. What I soon discovered was this was really the story of the state potentially putting a child in danger, potentially putting a young woman in in danger, who, thanks to the state, would now be forced to deal with the man who allegedly raped her, more on that later, not because it was a boneheaded move, no, not because it had a momentary lapse of reason, and if it did, this story, I might not be doing it right now. There's, there's boneheaded stories out there all over the place. They did it because the state was attempting to collect money. Now, as I describe this state to you, case to you, what you'll discover, I think you'll discover, I think you'll agree with me, is this is a story about the state attempting to collect money from a rapist. Alleged rapist. And I say alleged, by the way, because you kind of have to... CYA on that. Uh, he was not actually convicted of rape, but well, it it'll explain itself as I as I go along here. So so there's a picture of the dude. This is the guy we're talking about. Uh, well, actually, both guys. We're talking about the judge to the left if you're looking at the video, and the dude to the right. So first, I'm going to give you the facts of the case. And then I'm going to give you my thoughts about this case. So here are the facts. Sanilac County Circuit Court Judge, which is in Michigan near Detroit, uh, Gregory S. Ross recently granted joint legal custody of the child of a woman 
that 27-year-old Christopher Mirasolo allegedly raped when she was 12 years old. Now, there's no doubt that the now 8-year-old child is his as a DNA test uh, basically has proven that, that he's the father. Now, this, as you can simply do the math, you'll figure out, well, the alleged rape happened in 2008, so I imagine the 8-year-old will actually be 9 some well actually nine month pregnancy whatever essentially the alleged rape happened in 2008 now according to court records Marisolo gave the then 12 year old a ride along with her 13 year old sister and friend but after they got in the vehicle Marisolo then threatened to kill the girl if she didn't have sex with him well there's there's actually more to it than that and I'll get to that Rebecca Kissling I'm going to get to it right here the lawyer representing the young girl, now a young woman, said to the Detroit News, and, and this is a quote right from there, she, her 13-year-old sister, and a friend all slipped out of their house one night to meet a boy and the boy's uh, older friend. Uh, well, actually, they went to meet a boy, and the boy's older friend, Mirasolo, showed up and asked if they wanted to go for a ride. They thought they were going to McDonald's or somewhere. Instead, he tossed their cell phones away. He drove to Detroit where he stole gas from a station and then drove back to Sanilac County where he kept them captive for two days in a vacant house near a relative, finally releasing the older sister in a park. He threatened to kill them kill them if he told anyone what happened now what's missing is in there is the during that time that's when the quote-unquote alleged rape took place and again we we say alleged rape and and the reason why we have to say alleged rape is this a month later Mirasolo was arrested he later pled guilty to Attempted third-degree criminal sexual assault. That's right. Attempted third-degree criminal sexual assault. Uh, well, actually, excuse me. Attempted third-degree criminal sexual conduct. That's the plea deal that the DA worked out with this guy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. He, he took these girls. He essentially kidnapped them. He essentially raped them. And he ended up pleading guilty to third-degree criminal sexual conduct. So you can't say that he's a rapist. He's an alleged rapist because he wasn't convicted of that. He ended up serving just six months at county jail. It was a, I think it was a, a one-year sentence, but he served six months, I guess, for good behavior. I don't know. But upon his release, what do you know? Uh, he'd later be convicted in 2010 for sexual assault against a minor. Now, this time... This time they put him away for four years, four whole years. So he served a total of four and a half years for essentially raping two underage people. I don't know if this, I'm assuming the minor was a girl, but I don't know for sure. So I guess you're all wondering what I was wondering. How did the judge come to award this pedophile, this convicted pedophile, joint legal custody of a child that was the product of him allegedly, and I, again, I have to say that for legal purposes, raping and kidnapping a 12-year-old girl? Well, if you talk to his attorney, Barbara Yoki, you'll learn that Mirasolo, he had absolutely nothing to do with the case, even coming before the judge. And his attorney stated he never initiated this. It was something routinely done by the prosecutor's office when a party makes application for state assistance. See, that last part, that's what got my interest in this story. That's why this is an eye talk and not maybe a link that I'll share somewhere. <laughs> The victim, who is now a young woman, she happened to apply for state assistance. She was receiving 260 a month in food stamps for her and her son, along with health insurance coverage. So the state, it seems, was looking for a way to get some of the money back. So, well, 
They initiated a process to declare that the convicted sexual assaulter and alleged rapist and alleged kidnapper be awarded legal custodial rights of a child born to one of his victims. And they did it so that they could then start legal proceedings to get this man to pay custody for the child. That's right. The court awarded joint custody of a child to a convicted pedophile so that they could get money out of him. There was no provision provided, no conditions, which means if this man so chose that he could insist on having the child stay with him for whatever joint custody would allow him to do, this man can now enter, well, could now interject him, more on that later, self into the life of one of his victims because the state wanted to get money from him. I just want you to look here at the judge. That's the guy. That's the judge. And there's that young man. And now for my opinion. This case, to me, illustrates an ugly reality about your relationship to this coercive enterprise, the state. Uh, that is, thankfully, not often laid so nakedly bare as it is here. Who and what you are as it relates to the state is, is simply this. You're either an asset or you're a liability. Now, according to that status, the state will act either for you or against you. So in this case, you have a poor young woman and her son who are a uh, net loss to the state's bottom line. They're, they're getting assistance. And then the sexual assaulter and convicted pedophile, well, that's a potential source to offset the net loss of the young woman and her son. Now, this fact and the fact that this young woman has little real power to resist the state's legal, legal assault on her security and the safety of her son makes it an easy decision for the owners and managers of the coercive enterprise to make. To open a door to danger for the sake of getting a few bucks from someone. This young woman, however, was lucky. Her story was picked up by a local radio station, then a newspaper, and now it's been circulated to multiple other news outlets and blogs, including the blog that, that I'm uh, using, which is my blog, iState.tv. And again, I'll link the article that I'm basing this video on in the description and the, and the, the, the comment below. So because of that, uh, there was a real backlash, a real display of power that raised the cost of coercion for the state and made it a net loss for them to continue to allow the door to remain open. The door that they open, the door that allows a convicted pedophile to walk right into the life of one of his victims. Now, as a consequence of a real power display, the district court judge stayed his order that just, just yesterday, Tuesday, October 10th. And he did not do this, folks. He did not do this because he suddenly saw the insanity of his decision, but because the person looking back at him was no longer simply a young girl with no real power to resist an insane ruling. Instead, he was looking back at a courtroom filled with media and allies and pissed off citizens. What happened here? The state had shown itself to be too nakedly ruthless in its assessment of asset versus liability. The state had shown itself to be too nakedly ruthless in attempting to cut out a lost pound of flesh, its own, from someone else's pound of flesh, the convicted pedophile. Now this case, and many like it that sadly never see the light of day, is an illustration of a saying that I often repeat, and that is this. Folks, there is no rule of law. There is only, only, only rule of power. 
Sure. I know what's going to happen. The state will dress this up with all kinds of uh, polite legal expressions. And, and, and the sad thing is even the ones who fought to protect this girl will cite the power of law to right wrongs. But at the end of the day, the story, it's a story simply of power. It was power that rolled back the latest attempt by the state to get as much as it can out of the livestock, the livestock that is you and me. I'm Paul Gordon, and this has been your I State I Talk of the Day. As usual, make sure that you like, share, comment. I'd love to hear what you thought about the video. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash iState. And if you're going to subscribe, you might as well hit that bell right next to the subscribe button so you know the next time we make a video. Because you will not see us and we will not see you until the next time we make a video.